I mean that. I was, I was blessed. I know the Lord was blessed. Sister, you, you, you're anointed. I like it when something comes out with a person's word. You know what's in somebody's spirit? Your words are vehicles that carry something out of your spirit. They're containers that carry something out of your spirit. I felt the Spirit of God just come forth the moment worship began. And then when, I don't know what they call you around here, Pastor Bob, Pastor Langevin, what do they call you? Constable, pastor, I mean, many things. Uh, brother, uh, it's not even fair. I, I, all I can do is preach. I can't play an instrument. I can't sing. My children, I start singing, and they say, oh, Dad, please preach. Just preach. We'll listen to you preach, but please don't say. That's not even fair. Man, that was anointed. I, I love that. And that song that you were doing, Sister, uh, I can't remember all the words. My daughters say I have some timers, and I rebuke those kind of statements, but they said, sometimes you remember and sometimes you don't. That song about pushing back the darkness, that, oh, man, I got excited. Well, I don't want to talk, talk too much time away, but I'm blessed to be here, and I'm honored uh, to be asked, and I believe it was God's will that I be here. I was in Los Angeles last week, and then last Wednesday I was preaching in Kingman, Arizona, and, and drove my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, back from Los Angeles, she's going to finish up <clears throat> our uh, college in Missouri. Thank God. I'm glad to have her out of Los Angeles. And then I'm now I'm on the East Coast, so I'm everywhere and in between, and I'm excited to be flying back on Monday during the eclipse. I'm going to be lifting up Jesus and disturbing the atmosphere as I fly through it. Hallelujah. Is it all right to think like that? I believe we ought to go around disturbing the atmosphere, and I don't think Christians ought to walk around like they have to have permission to share the oxygen supply. Now, I got off the plane in Nicaragua. I just preached in Nicaragua and had tremendous meetings in that communist nation, and I felt like I had dominion everywhere I went. Not me. It's something in me. And I got off the plane and walked out and, and just stopped. All the other passengers walking past me, I stopped. You know, there they put steps down. You walk across the ground. You know that. You've been around. And... Uh, I just stopped. Everybody's walking past me, and I stood there, and I just said, I come, looked up in the air, and I said, I come in the name of Jesus. I have an intimate relationship with the king who rules everything. That's, that's the attitude I want to live with. I'm not going to walk around like I have to ask permission to share the oxygen supply. I'm not going to be intimidated by people in this world. I'm hooked up to heaven. And I don't belong to this world anyway. Anybody glad about that? I don't even belong to this world. I, I'm an alien here. I'm from another planet. I'm from another country. I'm from the country my father comes from. And if you check my DNA, you'll find I've got DNA that's not from this world. So I belong to heaven. I'm just on loan here for a little while. And if some of the people that want to kill me succeed and I got... A number of them that want to kill me. You, I can tell you stories. If they succeed, they still lose. The devil still loses because I'm ready to get out of this miserable thing I have to walk around in anyway. Get out of this body and see what's... My goodness. Oh, I hope that faith will just rise in your heart tonight and you'll realize we are kings and priests before God. We're in this world, but not of it. Heaven laid claim to my life. When I got born again, I was an old hippie, drug dealer, drug addict. I won't tell you stories. I don't want to scare anybody. I mean, I was bad. I was in jail. I don't know how, I can't count how many times. Uh, but I got saved. I got delivered. Hallelujah. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven laid claim to me and took me out of the kingdom of darkness and translated me and brought me over here into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God's dear son. I haven't been the same since. Then I got around some people that started telling me that it wasn't enough. I thought, wasn't enough? I was so excited about Jesus, I talked to everything that moved. I witnessed everything that moved and something that didn't move. I'd go preach to trees and telephone poles. I was so excited. I was just practicing preaching before I was even a preacher. I couldn't help it. And then some people started telling me I needed more. They started telling me about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was dry. I wasn't even in a church when I got baptized in the Spirit. I was driving down the highway, and my uh, 
hippie mobile. My, it got converted when I did, though. I had a 56 Chevrolet panel truck that was all fixed up like you do those days. But uh, when I got saved, I went a little crazy. People thought I went a little crazy. Had a big quantity of drugs. I was de dealing drugs. Had people at a party to sample the drugs I had. And then I was going to send them out to sell them. But I got saved in the middle of my acid trip. Went, got, went and bowed my, down, on, on my knees in the middle of an acid trip. And after I prayed, I was straight. I mean, clear-minded. And uh, I started flushing drugs down the toilet, had to fight people. They were trying to keep me from it. But uh, I tell you what, I got delivered, and I got set free, and everything changed. But then, and I, I thought, what's more? What more than this? I had the love of Jesus in my heart. But then I got baptized in the Spirit, driving down the highway in my converted 56 Chevrolet panel truck. When I got saved, I, I took a can of spray paint, painted on one side, Jesus saves in big white letters, painted on the back, Jesus saves, and on the front, Jesus saves, and on the side that met a telephone pole on the way home from a party one night, I painted life a wreck, try Jesus. People used to, people used to follow that thing, to, and they knew wherever it stopped, there'd be a party. They started following me after I got saved just to see what was going on, and it always stopped at a church or something. They didn't know what to do. Oh, I tell you, it was exciting, but one day I was driving down the highway, in my converted panel truck, and I was praying to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. These people kept telling me I needed more, and here was my prayer, simple prayer. God likes simple prayers, sincere. I said, God, Mary, the mother of Jesus, had it. So I'd tell Catholics. <laughs> when I'm witnessing to Catholics, I say, you need to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. They don't believe me. I say, Mary, the mother of Jesus, did. But, uh, and I said, that's how I said, I said, God, Mary had it. Peter had it. Paul got it. I don't see why I shouldn't have it. And I just said, Jesus baptized me. I'm driving down the highway, and I just, it was like a volcano. Me, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be so dramatic. It's like a volcano, and it erupted, and I haven't recovered since. I never got over it. Hallelujah. I'm so excited tonight. I like to be places where people worship God in spirit and in truth. You know, the amazing thing about the, do you, do you say Holy Ghost around here or Holy Spirit or both? Good. I, I, like, I like it where churches say both because uh, some of them, man, it just, it's messed up. You know, I preach in a lot of different churches. One place you say Holy Spirit, they get mad. Another place you say Holy Ghost, they get mad. So I try to say both. But uh, I get excited because I realize that what happened, I don't know why I'm talking to you like this before I even get started, but I am. I'm even going to do a commercial before I take off my books. But um, I'm excited. I want you to get excited about this too. you got to know you're hooked up to heaven by the Spirit. You're joined to Jesus by the Spirit. Jesus is raised and seated in the place of supreme authority. And you're raised and seated with him, and you're joined to him by the Spirit. Hallelujah. So uh, I get excited when I think that the same Spirit that got Jesus up and walked him out of the tomb and the same Spirit that came into an upper room and caused Peter, who had been afraid to even tell a little girl he was a Christian, to go out and preach under a powerful anointing to a hostile crowd at that that same spirit that came as a rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire into an upper room in Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago, jumped across the water, and tonight he's in an upper room in, what are we at, New Bedford? Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? It's the same spirit. Oh, you know, you know why I'm excited? Because the same spirit that anointed Jesus, the same spirit that lived in Jesus, the same spirit that came into the upper room is the spirit that's living in me. My goodness. That's why I walk around and just believe that wherever I go, there's something in me that's greater than everything around me. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I'm going to live with that attitude. Amen. I want, you to, I want you to get faith in your heart tonight. We have to rise up in faith in these days. John wrote in his epistle, chapter 5, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Hallelujah. We sing about being overcomers. I believe it. I'm an overcomer. 
the devil could kill me. He's still going to lose because all he can do is kill this body. And when he does, I'm getting out of here because I'm not this body anyway. I just happen to live in it for a little while. So I want to live with that attitude. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. That is all for free. Let me do a quick commercial about my books. I hope you buy these. I don't want to carry them back home, and uh, there's not a lot of people, so buy some to give away. I'm going to give you the Pastor Bob Langevin special tonight. You can go. These are published by Creation House. I have several others, but these are three of the latest. And uh, you can buy them from Creation House or Barnes & Noble and ChristianBook.com, a lot of other places. You can pay about fourteen ninety nine for either one of these, and I think this one's ten ninety nine. But tonight, you can buy them for seven dollars a piece. Sound like a salesman, don't I? It's like I don't want to don't want to make the house a uh, uh, got uh, merchandise. But when you're doing this, when you're doing this to books, you're not doing that. Uh, or you can buy them for uh, three for fifteen dollars. I I got these at author's discount, and uh, I'm not trying to get rich off of them. I just want to get them out. This one's called Sacred Fire. Why don't we try Pentecost one more time? I deal with the philosophies, modern philosophies or postmodern philosophies that where churches, even Pentecostal churches, are restricting the moving and the gifts of the Spirit. You've got to be an airhead to do that. That's not politically correct. I'm probably, probably not supposed to talk that way in Massachusetts. should be more politically correct than to say, say you've got to be an airhead to do that. The, but I deal with all those philosophies that restrict the moving and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I say, we need the power of God like never before. Why in the world would you want to trade the power of God for the programs of men? Why would you want to trade the power of the Almighty Spirit of God for the philosophies of men? So sacred fire. Why don't we try Pentecost one more time? And then because religious people upset my stomach and caused me trouble all over the world. I wrote a book called Why Love Hates Legalism, an irreverent indictment of mean religion. You ever meet anybody that had mean religion? Man, I have all over the world. And uh, uh, this book, Why Love Hates Legalism, I help people understand the difference between holiness and legalism. Legalism is always focused on the external. Holiness is focused on the internal, it's a beautiful thing of the heart. And where there's holiness, there's always life. Where there's legalism, there's always death. And uh, I deal with a lot of that in this book. And then this book closed doors to me throughout the nation. I wrote this book, and my son said, Dad, why don't you just shoot yourself in both feet? Because a lot of those big churches where I used to speak don't call me anymore. This book's called Devil on the Front Row. Let's see. Well, we got now. Three, only three people on the front row. It's not, not you guys. The devil on the front row, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons in the church. I, I saw this book, I say, the devil attends church, attends mega churches throughout the United States of America, sits on the front row through the entire service, and never has an uncomfortable moment. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But sadly, it's true. Now, I think if the devil came in here tonight, he would have been a little bit uncomfortable. He doesn't like it when people praise God the way you did in here. So that's, that's how I feel. I think it's more important. Don't, we get fixated on numbers and bigness. America bows down at the altars of bigness. But I'm telling you what, God's looking for people who worship in the spirit and truth. And if the devil comes into a meeting where I'm preaching, I don't want him to have one comfortable moment. If there are devils that come, come into a meeting, I want them to be miserable. Amen? So anyway, uh, $7 a piece or 3 for 15 that's a good deal. I promise you that's a good deal. And, uh, and it's not because we're not selling them. We are selling those. We have to order more all the time. But uh, I want to I do that. All right, I want to preach to you tonight a little bit about Elijah. Elijah. And I'm glad you young people are in here. I got to shake hands with some of these young ones. Hallelujah. I'm going to shake hands with you again. Can I shake hands with you? I like, I like having young, young folks in here, and uh, I like it when I see a young man up on his knees praying. You don't see that very often, Pastor, these days. You don't see it. You know, a lot of churches don't even have it where you can come down and kneel down and act like that there's something uh, that you can use for an altar. They've got rid of the cross. They've got rid of the altars. And thank God you have a pastor that seems to still want those things. Hallelujah. But uh, I'm glad you're in here, and you young people, I'm not preaching 
to the adults, I'm preaching to you. I'd rather you get stirred up than these old folks with white hair like me. I'd rather some of you younger ones get stirred up. If, but some of, some of you older ones got to get stirred up too. You know why? Because this, this young generation will never get across the river without some of us to help them. So not, everyone, not all of them realize that. But uh, I'm glad you're in here. And I want to talk about Elijah. Elijah just comes on the scene out of nowhere. In 1 Kings chapter 17, he just shows up and it says, Elijah the Tishbite. Man, just saying that name, I think, man, I bet he was bad to the bone. Tishbite. How would you like to have a name? I wish my last name was Tishbite instead of Sutton. Who are you? I'm Evangelist Tishbite. What do you think of that? All right, man, I don't want any trouble. Elijah the Tishbite. He just comes out of nowhere, and he comes on the scene. And he shuts up the heavens for three and a half years because there's wickedness in the land. That, that Ahab and Jezebel are in the palace, and false prophets are everywhere, and wickedness is being committed throughout the nation. And when God gets ready to deal with it, what does he do? He doesn't look for a bunch of politicians to sit down and, and try to figure out what to do. He finds a preacher. God always finds a man or a woman of God who will speak the word, and then God acts. All God ever needed was a preacher. All God ever needed was a preacher. And Elijah the Tishbite came on the scene and in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the evil, surrounded by false prophets, a crazy king who was trying to hunt him down like a dog, he wanted him dead. Elijah stood up and he said, because of all the sin and all the wickedness, the heavens are going to be shut up for three and a half years. There's not going to be rain or dew on the earth for three and a half years. And then he took off. Ahab and Jezebel were killing the true prophets of God. And they're doing that in other nations. I've been in nations where they're doing that. They'll probably be trying to do that in the United States of America before long. I don't have any illusions, but God can hide me if he wants to, or he can take me to heaven. I'd just soon get to heaven, but if he's got something for me to do, I'll stay around. But Elijah comes in the midst of that kind of a situation and begins speaking and uh, to the king, with all the false prophets, everything going on, Elijah says, God's going to deal with this wickedness, and there's not going to be rain for three and a half years. And then Elijah takes off, and he ended up over by a brook called Cherith. You remember that story? And uh, he was there at that brook for a long time, and it says ravens were bringing him food every day. Isn't that amazing? Uh, ravens aren't usually that friendly, and they don't carry food to people, but God commanded the ravens to bring Elijah food but then one day the brook dried up. Did you ever have that happen? You had a nice place and everything was flowing and there was provision and then it just dried up. It's hard. It's hard, isn't it? I've been there. It's tough. I mean, a lot of people are facing tough times. But God said, all right, Elijah, get up and go on over to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow there to take care of you. Elijah, you know, he was a prosperity preacher, you can tell, because God sent him to a big mansion to live and hang out till it was time to come out and speak in other words. No, he didn't. He sent him to a widow's house, and he lived in a little loft in the widow's house. Isn't that something? Anybody think Elijah was a man of faith? I think he had some faith. But he was living in a little loft in a widow's house, and he didn't trip over it. He didn't get upset about it. And the widow, when he got there, she didn't have anything. He asked for a little little cake, and she said, we don't have anything. All we have is a little bit of meal, a little bit of oil. We're going to fix a little cake. We're gonna, my son and I, we're going to eat it, and we're going to die. Isn't that a great attitude to have? We're going to eat it, and we're going to die. Real attitude of faith, wasn't it? And so what does Elijah do? It sounds just like a preacher. He said, make me a cake first. She just told him it's the last cake. And so he said, make me a cake first for crying out loud. But she was smart. She thought, this is an anointed man of God, not one of these con artists on Christian television that has a new gimmick every day to try to steal your money. Elijah was the real deal. And when he spoke something, there was anointed, and this woman had a sense enough to figure it out, so she made him a cake and gave it to him, and then he stayed with her. And it says that, that the barrel of oil, uh, or the cruise of oil, and the barrel of meal didn't fail for all those days. They were supernaturally sustained. The miracle was in the house. You probably may have heard that message. 
Sometimes you think you don't have anything. You don't think there's any hope. And all the while, the miracle is in the house. We're looking for some big thing to come from somewhere. And all the while, the miracle's in the house. It could be in the house right here tonight. There might be more here than you realize. In fact, you could take a little and put it in God's hands, and a little can become a lot. And this crowd could become a bigger crowd. And this building could have to become a bigger building. In fact, if God moves like I believe he's going to move in these last days, there's going to be another revival. There's going to be a great revival. I believe it's going to be in the midst of judgment. But it's going to it's going to break out and I believe it's going to become it's going to come to pastors like Pastor Robert Langeman and churches where God is worshiped in spirit and truth and some of those that think they got it going on and think they got it figured out are going to be scratching their heads saying what happened because the real power and the real Holy Ghost is going to stand up in churches like this. Oh, hallelujah. I believe that because I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. You can listen to all these brilliant men and the superstars of religion if you want to to have it all figured out, or you can read the Bible and believe the Bible. Well, I look for a hero. I don't look on Christian television. I find a profile of a preacher in the Bible, and Elijah is one of my heroes. Oh, hallelujah. I believe revival's coming. But Elijah, I'm just telling this story, he stayed there at the widow's house for three and a half years. What do you think he was doing? Yeah, I mean, the false prophets, they're living in prosperity, man. They're feasting, if you know the story. They're feasting in the palace. They're sitting down at Jezebel's table. Jezebel had everything going her way. 850 false prophets, popular preachers, telling everybody how wonderful they were. And how wonderful their life was going to be. Tell them, tell them every day can be a Friday. I mean, they were just saying, oh, it's wonderful. It's just all wonderful. And uh, they were popular. The crowds were flocking to them. Elijah couldn't hardly get anybody to come listen to him. But there are false prophets, and the crowds are flocking to them. And they're sitting down at the queen's table, feasting in the palace. They were the prosperity preachers of Elijah's day. Now, I don't have anything against prosperity. I plan on... I have prospered. God sent me all the world. I, I'm amazed at things God did, and I'm going to have to prosper again because I got some vision inside me, and God's going to have to pay for it because I don't have the money to, to so God's going to have to take responsibility for it. I believe in Bible prosperity, but I don't believe in this nonsense that's often called prosperity in the United States because Bible prosperity, you don't sell yourself to the devil to obtain it. But all the prosperity preachers are sitting down over at Jezebel's table. They think they got it all going on. but And Jezebel, it looks like everything's going her way, but Jezebel couldn't sleep at night. Had a terrible case of insomnia. If I gave this message a title, I, I, might, call, I might call it Why Jezebel Couldn't Sleep. Why Jezebel Couldn't Sleep. You know what kept Jezebel up at night? She had 850 false prophets around her table. Everything's going her way. She was running everything, even her husband. Bad as Ahab was, that woman had him. I mean, she, he, you know, he was the head, but she was the neck, and she could turn the head in any direction she wanted to. <laughs> I mean, she was running everything. But you know why she couldn't sleep tonight? Because there was one bald-headed old prophet who wouldn't bow down and play the game. Elijah wouldn't shut up. And because of one prophet, she couldn't sleep at night. I'm telling you what, the devil's the same way. He's just like Jezebel. And as long as there's somebody on the planet that won't back up and won't shut up, the devil is going to be disturbed. And I want him to be disturbed. I want to disturb devils every way I can. They mess with me long enough. I'm going to mess with them. Now that God's given me authority, I might as well use it. And I don't like what they're doing. I want them to be disturbed. Jezebel couldn't sleep at night because Elijah wouldn't play the silly games that all the false prophets were playing. He wouldn't sell out. I'm telling you what, sometimes you think it might look kind of small. Elijah's just over there in a loft at a widow's house. You might think that's, that's just some insignificant little thing that's not going to amount to anything. But that's where God was at. That's where God was at. That's where the anointing was at. 
And then Obadiah, there were a few faithful prophets, a man named Obadiah who was an official in the king's palace, hid 50 prophets in one cave and 50 prophets in another cave. They didn't kill all the real ones. Hallelujah. So that's, that's a little background on Elijah. Now I want to get into chapter 18. And uh, Elijah comes out. When he came out, I mean, he was there three and a half years. What do you think he was doing that three and a half years? They were probably eating that meal every day, but they probably grew a few vegetables and did a few things. But Isaiah had to stay on the down low, had to live under the radar. And uh, they probably grew a few vegetables. But I bet you Elijah had a lot of time to pray, a lot of time to meditate, and a lot of time to spend in the Word, stay before God. And I bet God did some things down deep in his sanctified soul during that time. You know, I just survived a horrible bout with malaria. Uh, I've had malaria multiple times. I've, it was all over Africa. But, man, and, and, it, and I lost a whole lot during that time. And I won't tell you because I don't want you all to cry if you heard everything I lost. But you know what? I gained something in here, the treasure is inside me now, the treasure. I'm a different man because I, what I went through, because God brought me through it. I bet you Elijah went through some stuff. I bet you God was dealing with him and speaking to him. And when the word of the Lord came, that's when Elijah came back out. He didn't move except at the word of the Lord. And when the word of the Lord came, Elijah came out and he confronted Ahab in chapter 18. And uh, he, he first talked to Obadiah, who was an official in Ahab's court. He said, tell Ahab I want to talk to him. Oh, we need prophets like that. Thank God for Franklin Graham. I mean, he stood up and spoke up like a lot of preachers should have, should have uh, not just to support uh, anybody, uh, one particular person, but to stand for righteousness. And he's still doing today. We need some prophets who do that. Elijah went right to the king and told the king, you're the one who's troubling Israel. And he said, now here's what I want you to do. He went and talked to the king. Man, I'd like to have an opportunity like that. God, I want to be able to get me to the place where I can walk up to a king and say, hey, get all the false prophets and get them up to the mountain, Mount Carmel. Get all of them. 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove, all 850 of them, get them up to Mount Carmel. And we're going to see who God really is. That's where uh, chapter 18 begins. And uh, Ahab did it. Got all those false prophets up there. It was 850 to 1. <laughs> what about them odds? <laughs> what about those odds? 850 to 1. It's the gunfight at the OK Corral, man. It's going to be bad on Mount Carmel. And there's one bald-headed old prophet that's challenging all 850 of them at the same time. People think he's lost his mind. He's been out in the sun too long. That bald head's just been cooked. He, his brain's been fried. They're thinking, this man's crazy. He's challenging 850, and there's only one of him. That's the story. That's where we begin in uh, 1 Kings 18. Now, I want you to see this. You jump all the way uh, over uh, 1 Kings 18, and uh, Elijah uh, says in, in verse uh, 17, I have, Ahab uh, saw Elijah and said to him, are you, you he trouble, who troubles Israel? Elijah answered, and he said, I haven't troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, and that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Balaam. You know what's happening in the United States of America? People are forsaking the commandments of the Lord. Trying, there are people rewriting history, trying to say that we don't have a Christian heritage. There's no Judeo-Christian heritage heritage to this nation, doing everything they can. We have a Supreme Court that defied the Bible. They know better than what they did. They know it was wrong to do what they did, but they did it anyway, and they thumbed their nose at God. They defied the Bible, and I'm telling you what, God doesn't just ignore that. People get, get, get real loud, and they start talking, and they think they can just do whatever they want to do, but there's a point where God said, all right, I had enough of that, and he sends somebody like Elijah, and that's what happened. Elijah said, no, you're the one that's troubled Israel. Because you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord. Verse 19, Elijah said, now get all the prophets. I already told you that. And all of them, 
that feasts at Jezebel's table. So Ahab did it, and they gathered the prophets together, and they all came up to Mount Carmel. So you got a picture? 850 on one side, bald-headed old prophet on the other side. Oh, Jesus. Man, I wish I could get a bunch of these guys. I wish I could just get them at some big conference center somewhere and say, you all come. All of you come down there. And just, just get in that one room. I don't know how many of them. 850 to 1. Let's have it out. Oh, Jesus. God grant it. Grant it. But um, it says, Elijah came unto all the people in verse 21 and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? He's, he's saying it's time to make up your mind. All right? Time to, it's time to fish or cut bait. Do they say that in Massachusetts on the East Coast? Time to fish your cut bait. It's time to make up your mind. No more vacillating. No more double-mindedness. You're going to have to choose this day who you're going to serve. You're going to have to come to the place where you say, I'm all in. No more playing games. Now, some people still playing games. Some people knew about this meeting tonight. They knew I was coming. They should have been here. They should have been here. But they made a decision to stay home and watch television. I mean, television instead. And, uh, <laughs> it's true it's true you got to make up i'm going to be all in if the doors are open i'm going to be there i don't want to miss something i might miss the meeting and that might be the meeting when the rushing mighty wind comes and the tongues of fire fall can you imagine on the day of pentecost do you know i i, <laughs> I know there was at least 500 invited and only uh 120 showed up. Can you imagine that 380 that didn't come, coming to those people later and saying, uh, hey, tell us about the meeting. Well, you know, you would just needed to have been there. <laughs> or, uh, hey, oh, get a CD. Yeah, sure. You never know what you might miss by not showing up. Someday, some meeting, God's going to break out. Everything's going to break loose. I don't want to miss that meeting when it happens. I want to live with expectation. What do you think this is all about? I'm not here just to preach another sermon, have another meeting, have somebody pat me on the back and on the way out the door say, that was a good message, Pastor. I don't care if it's a good message or not. I don't care whether I can preach or not. I care whether or not God touches your heart and the Word of God penetrates and the Spirit of God moves on you and you leave here a different person believing that God can do it again. That revival can break out in the midst of this mess. God's not going to leave this darkness unanswered, sister. God's going to answer this mess, and he's going to answer it with power. He's going to answer it with power. Someday there's going to be some. What's your name, man? You back there in the back row. Yeah. Huh? Huh? George? George. All right, that's a strong name. Hallelujah. God's going to find some young man on his knees during a worship service and anointing is going to come out of heaven and come on him and he's going to get up a different man full of fire and go out preaching and the devil's not even going to know what in the world happened. It's going to be a surprise attack. Bam! It's going to happen. Now, I want, I want you to live with expectation. I'm not just here to preach you a sermon. I've preached more sermons than one human being should have to preach in two or three lifetimes. But I like to preach. I preach. I'm not here just preaching another sermon. I want God to speak to you, and I want you to see what happened in the Bible and believe that it can happen again and believe that it can happen right here and believe that this group of believers that God has assembled around the vision that he put in this pastor's heart, this woman of God's heart, that it isn't just so you can have uh, nice little meetings and nice little church, but God wants to raise up an army that's going to make a difference in these last days. Elijah said, time to make up your mind. Don't halt between two opinions. Now, Elijah, uh, he was a little confused. He said uh, to the people, <laughs> he said, I feel this way sometimes. I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord. <laughs> that's pathetic, Elijah. You should have known better than that. But I know how he felt. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. He felt a little outnumbered. I do too. Sometimes I feel like they're shooting at me from every direction. People tell me I'm shell-shocked. They say, man, 
you just don't stop shooting, do you? I say, no, you wouldn't either if you saw what I see out there in the spirit and see it coming at you every time. That my wife said, you're like, and so you walk through the atmosphere, it's like static electricity. I said, that's why I'm shell-shocked. I'm going to stay on the fire line, and I'm just going to just, just, just everywhere I go, I'll just keep shooting until I get away and get, get in the Lord's presence, feel like there. I mean, we got to have a mentality that we're going to stand up in the power of God and fight darkness and fight evil, and we're going to prevail over it because there's a God who came to take up residence in us who can push the darkness back, just like our sister sang, just like we sing here tonight. Elijah, uh, uh, he thought he was the only one. He wasn't. But he said, now, you tell them to get to the, all these false prophets, get some... Uh, Bullocks, we're going to have, they're going to do an offering and, and get it ready. And he said, put wood uh, on the altar, but don't put any fire under it. You know why he said don't put any fire under it? Because there were prophets back then just like what we have today. They were using all kinds of tricks and lying signs and wonders to fool people. They'd build a fire underneath the uh, altar the way it was built. There was a pit under it. They'd have a fire going. They'd even have somebody down there to fan the flames. They'd put the bullock on it in the wood, and then they'd call on Baal and call on their gods, and the fire would, would uh, come up, and people were gullible enough to think that it was the fire of God coming down. Well, they're still gullible today, or they wouldn't be believing half this nonsense that's going on. But Elijah knew that, and he said, don't put any fire under it. He knew how they, these false prophets were, and uh, so they did it. They got... Uh, uh, the, the sacrifice of the wood, and they put on there. And Elijah said in verse 25, you call on the name of your gods. Don't put any fire in it. And they, they did what he said, and they started crying out to Baal. And they said, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped on the altar which was made. I want to tell you something. The devil can make a lot of noise, and... Uh, False prophets can make a lot of noise, but when God decides to move and when God sends his servant with the word and God decides to shut it up, all of a sudden they don't have anything to say. All of a sudden everything's different in a moment, and so they're crying and crying and crying, but now nothing's moving. There's no voice, and Elijah I watched them. They got so desperate, they're screaming and shouting, crying aloud, and Elijah starts mocking them. Now, people, I have trouble. I'm, I have preachers all the time that just tell me that I should be more polite, and they tell me that I just am a little too strong in some of the language I use, and uh, I just say, read the Bible. I'm, I'm probably not strong enough. I'm not radical enough, but Elijah... He didn't talk politely to these false prophets. He started mocking them. And uh, it says in verse 27 that uh, at noon that Elijah mocked them. Now, if you do that today, the, the well, I, I'll try not to get in too much trouble. People start screaming, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't talk that way. You shouldn't name a, a man of God. You shouldn't touch God's anointing. Well, Elijah mocked them. It says he mocked them. Man, Elijah must have been a big sinner. He's mock, mocking them. And he said, he said to them, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he's on a journey, or peradventure he sleeps. He says, maybe your God's sleeping. He's challenging all 850 of them. He's mocking them. A newer translation, one of the things says, Elijah says, maybe he's using the bathroom and can't come right now. But... Um, He's mocking them, and he's mocking their false gods. you got to have a little fire in your belly to do that. What's wrong with mocking? I'm not, it's not for everybody, but if God anoints you and you, you have an anointing and you have authority and you know it, we don't want to talk foolishly, but Elijah is, is moving under the anointing, and he's mocking them. And verse 28, they, they got even more frantic, and nothing happened. And it says, finally, it came to pass at midday, when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, and there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. 
Why? Because they were calling on a false god. And when God, the true and the living God, decides to stand up, all of a sudden the false god shut up. And one man defied 850 prophets of the false gods. And Elijah, verse 30, said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. I want to tell you, this is, these are the prerequisites for revival. What's the first thing Elijah did? He repaired the altar that was broken down. We've got to rebuild the altar. We've got to rebuild an altar in our heart. Thank God you still have an altar where you can come and pray in this church. A lot of churches where I preach, they don't even call people to an altar. They don't even have somebody like this young man like George coming up here kneeling down and praying during a worship service. Or this uh, young woman that got up here on her knees during worship, don't even have that anymore. They call people to come for the, the great man of God to, to touch him, and then they give him courtesy drops and uh, say the power of God was there. I mean that we need to repair the altar of the Lord in our homes, in our hearts, in our churches. I want there to be an altar. I want to spend time at the altar. You know why? Because life ought to be an altar for us. Every day we have the opportunity, we have the privilege, we have the high and distinct honor of presenting ourselves unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. I want to place myself on the altar and say, Oh God, come and consume this sacrifice. Make me thy fuel, thou flame of God. I want to burn. I want to be like the burning bush that Moses saw. I want to burn and not burn up. I'm 67 years old. I've been, been th through a little bit. My daughters think I look older than that. They try to get me to use just for men. I say, I'm not going to do it. Malaria turned my hair white, but it's really them that gave me the gray hair I have. So, but uh, I, I tell people, I'm not old. I've just been around a long time. But uh, I want to get stirred up. I want God to renew my youth. And I want to burn but not burn up. I want to stay here till the battle's over. I tell people, go ahead and check out Earl if you want to. I ask God permission. If, if the, the rapture takes place, if I can stay and fight, I'll stay here and fight. Just, uh, just uh, anoint me and use me. I'm telling you what, I want to burn and not burn up. I want the fire of God to consume me. Elijah said, you got to repair the altar of the Lord that's broken out. It's the first prerequisite to revival. Every great revival that's ever swept this nation begins with prayer. If you want true revival, you want to break out in this church, you want to break out in this region, you want to spread, it has to begin with prayer and it has to be sustained with prayer. That's why the these so-called movements that people call revival, they're not revivals at all. They center around one man, and uh, they're not sustained by prayer. I know they haven't been revivals because of the, the lack of emphasis on prayer. Every great revival in history, there's always prayer. There's always people who get stirred up to pray, and they begin praying to become spontaneous. Pretty soon, more people are praying, more people are praying, and when you get enough people praying, God can't help himself. He comes in power, and revival breaks out. I believe it's going to happen again. I believe it's going to happen again. Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Verse 21, he took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of Israel's, and... Uh, and uh, they built the altar. And so with the stones, he, he built the altar. In verse 32, he put wood in order on the altar, got it all ready. And then Elijah, just so he could let everybody know this isn't any of the silly games that the false prophets are praying, playing, he got water. He had him pour water on the wood and on the sacrifice and the pit around the altar. He had him bring water, and there wasn't much water in the land. Then it had rained for three and a half years. They're saying, look at he's wasting all that water. But what he was, he filled up the pit with water. What was he doing? He was showing them if fire comes here, it's going to be a miracle. It's going to be because God shows up. Not any of this foolishness or lying signs and wonders. It's going to be God. So he put water uh, all over it, ran everywhere, and it says at verse 36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Oh, that's a good way to pray. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant 
and that I've done all these things at thy word. Oh, that's how God wants us to operate, to walk in the Spirit and move in obedience to his word. I witnessed to a Jewish rabbi coming from Columbia, South America one time, and he spoke Spanish, and, and uh, so I was speaking to him in Spanish, trying to tell him that we were brothers and uh, that served the same God, and he, w- he wouldn't even look at me, no emotion or whatever. I mean, he was orthodox and dressed, you know, in orthodox garb, and I'm all the way, and I'm saying, hey, what do you think about Isaiah 53? Some, some people think that that's a pretty specific prophecy that points to Jesus and that maybe the Messiah has already been here and, and you're looking for him to come, but maybe when he comes, he'll have nail prints in his hands. And he, he didn't respond. He didn't say, I thought, well, I don't mind feeling a little, it was a little uncomfortable, but I, thought, I don't mind feeling a little uncomfortable, being embarrassed. So I kept, I didn't get a response out of him. So finally, just as the plane's coming in and, and landing, I said, may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you. And he looked at me and smiled and shook my hand. So I said, hallelujah. I told him, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish too. I said, I am an heir of God because of Abraham. I got in on the covenant and I talked to him. But Elijah prayed and he said, the, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And he prayed. And uh, when he prayed, he said, hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Man, could it happen again? Could it happen again? Shouldn't we be believing that if it happened here in the Bible and we're reading about it, shouldn't we be believing that it could happen again? If what happened in the upper room happened as the church, the inception of the church, shouldn't we be, be believing that we can have upper room experiences today? It can happen again. Let's believe God. It can happen again. Hallelujah. I better hurry up here because some of you look at me like he could preach all night. You're right. You're right. But I won't. Listen. Uh, the fire of the Lord fell, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the God, the one and only God, the true and living God. Verse 40, Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. Man, gentle Jesus. That might be a myth, you know. Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink. There's a sound of abundance of rain. Whenever there's revival, first there's prayer, and then there's repentance. People repented. The fire of God fell. People repented. When revival breaks out, the fear of God will be restored, and there will be true repentance and dramatic conversion. Why, some of the most famous preachers in America don't even know how to say the word repent. Don't even know how to say the word sin. It's not in their vocabulary. It's pathetic. It's not, they're not preachers. They're motivational speakers. They're not preachers. If you can't say sin and repent, and if you can't preach the whole counsel of God, you're not a preacher. You're just a motivational speaker. Uh, They repented here, and when they repented, the fire of God fell, and the revival was on, and then Elijah said to turn and and, and, uh, said to Ahab, You better get out of here, for there's a sound of abundance of rain. I like to tell people, you know, that when you're in the Spirit, you're praying, you hear things that other people don't hear. You hear them before other people hear them. You you hear something, you say, that sounds like revival. It's coming. It's going to happen again. I'm going to live with expectation. Revival's going to break out. I'm not just going to keep knocking it out and going through it week after week. I'm not going to just keep doing uh, whatever has to be done. I'm going to live with expectation. The revival's going to break out. When it breaks out, it's going to pick me up and throw me out there, and I'm going to run. Power, the power of God moving. He... Uh, said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. People of faith hear things other people don't hear. Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. Some people say he got in a spiritual birthing position. That's how the women of Israel, uh, when they gave birth, they didn't lay down on a bed. They they, uh, got in a position just like Elijah. He put his face in his knees, and he's crying out to God. He's travailing. What's he crying out for? What's he praying about? 
what he heard in the spirit. He's praying that what he heard in the spirit can be brought about. That's where we miss it sometimes. We hear things from God. God speaks, but we forget that God works with us, and he works through us, and he expects us now to pray over what we heard and pray over what we saw and pray till we see it released into the earth. That's what has to happen today. God's speaking. Let's pray and pray and travail until we give birth to whatever it is God spoke, to whatever it is we heard. Let's pray until we see it manifest. That's what Elijah did. He started praying. Why? He wanted to give birth to the vision. He wanted to give birth to what he heard. He heard the sound of abundance of rain. He wanted to give birth to it. Elijah went up. What was he doing? He was praying. He was praying. Verse 43, and he said to his servant, go up now toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. Now you've maybe heard this story. Elijah's servant represents faith. Elijah sent his faith out to look for something. It came back empty-handed. That ever happened to you? Is it just me? You ever send your faith out? It came back empty-handed? Did you ever get a little discouraged? Did you ever wonder if God was still in the neighborhood? Did you ever wonder if he forgot your address? He hasn't. Elijah sent his servant out, and his servant came back. He said, there's nothing. What was Elijah looking for? He's looking for a cloud. He was looking for what he heard. When you hear something in the Spirit, don't just say, okay, well, it's going to happen. Say, hey, I'm going to pray over this till it happens. I'm going to pray this thing into being. What I heard in the Spirit, I'm going to reach out in prayer and take hold of it, and I'm going to bring it into this realm. I'm going to release it in this realm. How do you do that? You reach into the realm of the Spirit by faith, and you pull it down with prayer, and you turn it loose on the earth. Oh, God, help us to pray and to realize how significant prayer really is. I'm going to tell you, you can sit around here and think you're insignificant if you want to because you're just in a small building, a small group of people, or you can wake up and realize that there's more going on here than there is in a lot of mega churches all over the country that appear to have it all going on because there's some people worshiping God in spirit and truth and praying and expecting God to move, and there's a preacher here who hasn't sold out like so many have and haven't, hasn't compromised and compromised and compromised till there's nothing left. You hold on to the truth and you pray. At some point, God's going to show up. And the revival's going to be on. Amen? And uh, he said, there, Elijah, he saw the abundance of rain. He went up to pray, and then he sent a servant out. And he came back seven times. He, he said, there's nothing. Can you imagine that? The servant comes back and says, go look again. He comes back. He says, go look again. I think about the sixth time the servant said, Elijah, come on. It's been a good day, man. Let's just go home. I'm tired. I mean, look, this is a long meeting, Elijah. We came out here early this morning. It's been all day long. Now it's enough. It's enough. Look, you called fire down from heaven for crying out loud. You can go home and feel okay about yourself. That was a good sermon you preached. Fire fell. That was anointed prayer you prayed. Fire fell. I bet his servant's saying, come on, Elijah, let's go home. Elijah says, you go look again. He wouldn't give up. I like that kind of persistence. That's what we're going to have to have. We want to see God move in these last days. Persistence. Persistence in prayer. I will not quit. I will not turn back. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep praying till I see the power of God released in the earth. Forward, ever, backward, never. I'm coming through in Jesus' name. You can't stop me. That's the attitude Elijah had. Go out and look again. Servants thought, Elijah, you've been out in the sun too long, man. You should have put a cap on been out in the sun too long. Let's go home. Elijah said, go look again. And look what happened here. This, this is what can happen to people who pray with faith in their heart. Verse 44, it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Can you imagine sending your faith out over and over again. Then when you finally get the report, what's the servant? He's saying, Elijah. The sky's blue. There's not a cloud in the sky. I saw one little thing out there that looks like a cloud. It's no bigger than a man's hand. Man, that's enough to be discouraged over. All that prayer and all that faith and all you can produce is a cloud the size of a man's hand. It's time for Elijah just to go home discouraged. 
But look what he does. He got the report of that little cloud. What's he looking for? He's looking for a rain. He's looking for a thunderstorm. He's looking for a torrential downpour. And he sees it in a tiny little cloud. Isn't it amazing what faith can do? Faith can look at something that seems small and insignificant and see a thunderstorm in a tiny little cloud. And Elijah said, uh, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare your chariot and get down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meantime that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Israel. He outran the chariot. What in the world? Why did he get so excited? He got excited while it was still small. I want to try to end this tonight by challenging you to get excited while it's still small. Get excited while it, uh, it still seems insignificant. Get excited while people think nothing's really going on and you see that little thing, speak to it, pray over it, keep praying and believe that great things can come out of little things, that big things can come out of little things, that God can do greater things, greater than we've ever imagined. My son, if you could hear him, he's a preaching machine. He could preach circles around me. He would have had you stirred up and on your feet and jumping and shouting and everything else tonight. He's a preacher. And, uh, but you know what? And he's big now. He's bigger than I am. But you know what? One time he was a little bitty thing. But I had faith that God was going to do some of that little thing. I used to go lay hands on my wife's belly and I'd say, hey, you little prophet. And uh, I'd sing to him. I don't know if that helped him or not. But I'd sing to him, and I'd preach to him, and I'd prophesy to him. Now he's been all over the world preaching the gospel, and people everywhere, once they hear him, they don't want to hear me anymore. But he used to be a little bitty thing. Now he's bigger than I am, and he preaches the gospel in power. Don't ever forget that there's great potential of what seems to be a small thing. I want to challenge you. Go ahead and stand up so I can finish here tonight. I want to challenge you to believe tonight. Oh, God can move by his spirit. God can do it again. God can move on you, and God can use you. God has greater things in store for this church. I know he does. I'm not just talking. I know he does. But you be faithful in the meantime. I, Elijah was over there three and a half years praying and praying, waiting at the widow's house. But there was a time, there was a point after the praying, after the humbling himself, crying out to God that the word of the Lord came. And when the word of the Lord came and Elijah went out in obedience to the word, that's when everything broke loose. Fire came out of heaven. My God, let's rise up as a people of God. I'm not going to give this nation to the devil. I'm not going to give the devil one square inch of my real estate. I'm not going to lay down for the devil. I'm not going to roll over and play dead i'm going to proclaim that jesus is lord they just they i just had i just had some threats they threatened to lock me up i got threatening letters from lawyers i said go ahead and lock me up i begged them to arrest me i said i'll preach going into jail i'll preach once i'm there i'll sing praises at midnight i'll preach coming out and i'll make sure there's reporters and cameras when i come out so i can tell them what went on here my god let's stand up in the midst of this darkness let's defy the darkness and believe that the light of jesus in us is greater than the darkness don't you don't you wait around till you feel strong enough or you feel like you're qualified enough you're qualified right now i tell you what if you're weak and you're the devil may beat you half to death your brain may be traumatized mine was you may be under more pressure than anybody knows you may be under so much stress you don't know what you're going to do and the devil will come to you at those moments and he'll say you're too weak to even fight the devil is a liar when you're weak when you're weak his strength can be made perfect in your weakness don't you quit fighting while you're weak when i had malaria the devil tried to just get me to sit down and quit one day i got so mad i just stood up and started shouting speaking the things in the air i said i'm not gonna die sitting down and i began speaking the word of the lord i've been doing it ever since i want to challenge you i want to challenge you rise up 
take hold of God tonight. I saw, Sunday morning, I've got a message that's going to be a little more exciting than this. I just wanted to plant some seeds in your heart and challenge you to believe. I can't wait till, till Sunday morning and preach from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Oh, man, I may get raptured in the middle of my sermon. I, so I want you to be here Sunday. But tonight, I want to give you an opportunity. I don't know what time you, uh, you, you normally leave, probably a little later than, than normally already. But if you want to come up here and pray, uh, I want you to pray for a moment. Or if you just want to reach out to God right where you're at, come on, open your heart and say, Oh, God, seal this word to my heart. Let me see this, this picture of what happened on Mount Carmel and put faith in my heart to believe that it can happen again. Oh, hallelujah. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Hallelujah. Come on, reach out to Jesus tonight. Reach out to Jesus. Let him touch you. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. We need you. We need you. We need you. We want you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just reach out to him. Oh, God, let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. Hallelujah. Maybe you've been filled with the Spirit. Maybe you need to get filled all over again. Maybe you need a fresh touch, a fresh anointing. Ask God. Say, oh God, touch me. Touch me again. I want to return to my first love. Oh God, I want to come and place myself on the altar and give myself to you, not hold anything back. Why don't you make up your mind tonight? Say, oh Jesus, you have all of me. I give myself to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, touch your people tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, reach out to him.